so very grateful for Dr. Peter Kwasniewski for coming today. He was gave a conference at uh, Prince of Peace uh, yesterday, which was very well received. And uh, he had contacted me about coming here also, and I said I would love that. It would be great. And so I asked him if he could speak on a very current subject, the Amazon Synod, uh, to try to give some uh, theological in, uh, uh, insights into it and, um, and try to get some understanding of how to react to it and so on. So um, I have not heard his talk, uh, but it'll be, I know I've read some, many of his works and listened to his talks on YouTube also, um, so looking, uh, looking forward to it. Um, <clears throat> he is a graduate from Thomas Barnes College. I graduated in 94, uh, right? I graduated from the same college in 91, so we overlapped by one year. I met him there um, a long time ago. So this is the first time we actually physically meet uh, since then. So he went on to study at the Catholic University of America in Washington, um, taught at the International Theological Institute in Austria, um, and Franciscan University at Steubenville, Austrian program. And so, and then he is also uh, one of the founders of Wyoming Catholic College. Um, so... And now he's going around giving talks and so on, writing books. And there are, he has a few books available, a small handful, I guess. Uh, most of them got uh, bought up there at um, uh, Prince of Peace. So, but they are available on, on, the, uh, on Amazon, and I'll try to put a list of them on, the, uh, on our bulletin perhaps next week or on the website so you can uh, look for them and, and if you're interested. So we have... Um, He's going to give a talk, as I said, on the Amazon Synod, the theological uh, insights into it, and to try to understand things a little bit better. So without any further ado, here's uh, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. Yevsky. I always get the name wrong. <laughs> all right, good. Thank you, for, thank you all for being here today. Um, it's a beautiful day our Lord has given us. Catholics the world over have been disturbed, demoralized, scandalized, and galvanized by the recently completed Amazon Synod. As Brother André Marie observed, quote, the recently concluded Amazon Synod was at least as horrifying as expected. On display were idolatry, syncretism, indifferentism, feminism, modernism, radical environmentalism, and liberation theology a much more terrifying combination than anything Stephen King or John Carpenter could ever imagine." Unquote. A complete theological analysis of this synod would take many lectures, not just one, so I will have to be selective. In the Q&A afterwards, we can take up additional questions that you might have. My talk today will have four parts. First, I will discuss the violations of the First Commandment that took place at the Vatican. This will segue into part two on the concept of enculturation. Then part three will take up the proposal to abolish mandatory clerical celibacy. And part four, the proposal to ordain female deacons or deaconesses. So part one. I imagine that the first thing on everyone's mind is the commission of sins of idolatry that punctuated the synod. The Ten Commandments are listed in order of importance. Think about what that means. Having false gods is a sin worse than adultery or murder. For this reason, I did not hesitate to add my signature to the signatures of a hundred other scholars and pastors on the recent protest against Pope Francis's sacrilegious acts, dated November 9th and released November 12th. Maybe some of you have seen it. It was published on LifeSite and other places. Before continuing, we must define a key term, Pachamama. Pachamama is a South American fertility goddess or divinity venerated for centuries by pagans, by poorly evangelized or poorly catechized Christians, and more recently by some New Age cults. The protest, the November 9th protest, lists the following sacrilegious acts. On October 4th, Pope Francis attended an act of idolatrous worship of Pachamama. He allowed this worship to take place in the Vatican Gardens, desecrating the vicinity of the graves of the martyrs and of the Church of the Apostle Peter. He participated in this act of idolatrous worship by blessing a wooden image of Pachamama. On October 7th, the idol of Pachamama was placed in front of the main altar at St. Peter's and then carried in procession to the Synod Hall. Pope Francis said prayers in a ceremony involving this image and then joined in this procession. 
when wooden images of this pagan deity were removed from the church of Santa Maria in Traspontina, where they had been sacrilegiously placed, and thrown into the Tiber by Catholics outraged by this profanation of the church, Pope Francis, on October 25th, apologized for their removal, and another wooden image of Pachamama was returned to the church. Thus, a new profanation was initiated. On October 27th, in the closing mass for the synod, he accepted a bowl used in the idolatrous worship of Pachamama earlier, on October 4th, and placed it directly on the altar. Some commentators have dismissed the charges of idolatry and sacrilege, arguing that the wooden figures were not idols, that they were not being venerated as gods or spirits or forces of nature, and even that they were meant to represent the Virgin Mary, however offensively portrayed but these arguments do not hold water. Vatican officials repeatedly clarified that the pregnant female wooden figure was not intended to be an Amazonian representation of the Blessed Mother. At a news conference on October 16th, Father Giacomo Costa, a Vatican communications official for the Synod, stated, it is not the Virgin Mary. It is an indigenous woman who represents life and is neither pagan nor sacred. Paolo Ruffini, prefect of the Vatican Communications Dicastery, said, fundamentally it represents life, life through a woman. Finally, Pope Francis himself referred to these wooden images as being of Pachamama, that is definitely not the Blessed Virgin Mary. Father Costa's claim that the image is neither pagan nor sacred needs to be evaluated in the light of the recorded fact that in the Vatican Gardens and later in Santa Maria in Traspontina, the Pachamama images were integrated into religious ceremonies. The female shamaness can be seen on video raising hands before the twin Pachamama figurines, kneeling and prostrating herself face to the ground. In fact, they all do that, the whole group. It has been pointed out that even if this image were of the Blessed Virgin, which it isn't, such a gesture would still be reprehensible as superstition, since Catholic tradition sees full body prostration as a mark of adoration, which is reserved for God alone. We don't do that towards the Blessed Virgin Mary. The shamanist then presented one of the images to Pope Francis, who blessed the proffered wooden image with the sign of the cross. All this disproves Father Costa's preposterous claim that the Pachamama figurines are not seen as sacred by their devotees. And it renders ridiculous the claim that carrying Pachamama into a church in procession is not morally different from a sports team taking their banner into a church during mass, which apparently happens in some places. We've gotten a little bit obsessed with soccer, football. Um, since the Pachamama images do not represent the true God, the Blessed Mother, or any other Christian saint, the religious acts involving them stand condemned by Catholic teaching. The section entitled Idolatry in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it's, a good, it's good to go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church because it's a recent document, everybody agrees on it. So we, we don't have to go back to the Catechism of Trent. We can just take the new Catechism. Uh, that teaches in number 2112 that the first commandment in condemning polytheism, quote, requires man neither to believe in nor to venerate other divinities than the one true God, unquote. Note how the catechism uses the more general words venerate and divinities rather than adore and gods. The church is setting the bar relatively low as to what constitutes idolatry. While the prostrations she received strongly suggest latria or adoration, it is beyond dispute that Pachamama was at least venerated in these papally patronized ceremonies. The catechism's language also renders irrelevant the heated debate over whether Pachamama in the current Amazonian, as distinct from Incan or Peruvian usage, is truly seen as a goddess or not. For the word divinities is broader than god and goddess. It covers also the animistic and or pantheistic belief that certain objects and places are intrinsically sacred, numinous, holy, and to be religiously revered. So for example, there was veneration of sacred soil also during the synod, and that would, that would, that would count as idolatry as per the Catechism of the Catholic Church's definition. 
The religious honor given to Pachamama in Rome and elsewhere makes it clear that she, or the Earth Mother represented by her images, is seen by her devotees as a divinity of some sort, and certainly not the one true God. The female cult leader spoke explicitly of the divinity or divine quality inherent in the Amazonian soil that she reverently brought up in a black bowl, which was placed by papal fiat on the high altar during the final synod mass. Finally, the next paragraph of the catechism, number 2113, speaks of idolatry in quite general terms as being constituted by falsos paganismi cultus, false pagan worship. Since the Pachamama religious rites carried out in Rome were clearly not monotheistic, that is Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, it follows that they were pagan. The fact that Jesus, Mary, or a Christian saint or two are venerated alongside traditional tribal divinities, which is technically known as syncretism, mixing Christianity and paganism, would not stop such cults from being pagan. Hindus and some other pagans are often quite happy to include Jesus as one god among others in their various pantheons, as indeed the ancient Romans were willing to do. Little known fact, if the early Christians had just agreed to add Jesus to the other Roman divinities, they would have been left alone. Of course, they wouldn't do that. Stephen Mosier, famous for his decades-long work exposing the evils of China's policies on abortion and their violent treatment of the Catholic Church, adds these important details. Quote, the ritual on October 4th was presented as a tree planting ceremony celebrating St. Francis of Assisi's love of nature, but this was just a smoke screen. During the course of the ritual, Pope Francis received and blessed a Pachamama idol and was given a pagan necklace, an offering of soil to Pachamama, and a tukum ring. The tukum ring is a black wooden ring made from an Amazonian palm tree. It is often taken to symbolize a commitment to liberation theology, which is a Marxist distortion of the faith that emphasizes liberation from poverty over liberation from sin. But in shamanistic Pachamama rituals, such as the one conducted in the Vatican Gardens, it has a deeper and darker meaning. Here, on October 4th, a gourd rattle and occult spells were used to direct demonic energy to the tukum, which comes to represent a spiritual marriage with the earth goddess, or in fact, demon, since as scripture teaches, all the gods of the nations are demons. In the Vatican News video recording the ritual, the shamanist can be seen empowering the tukum with occult spells and her gourd rattle beginning at the 11 minute mark. She then approaches the Pope and puts the black ring on what appears to be the ring finger of his left hand at just before the 13 minute mark." Unquote. Mosier's report, report grows darker still when he discusses the significance of the bowl of soil with several plants bearing red flowers that was carried into the closing synod mass by a woman in Amazonian tribal dress. It is customary in South America, at least parts thereof, to mix the soil in such an offering bowl with the blood of a sacrificed animal, or in older times, blood of sacrificed children. Mosier continues, quote, such a Pachamama offering is intended as an act of reparation to the earth goddess for the sins that human beings have committed against her by taking from her the fruits of the earth, animal, vegetable, and mineral. In other words, it is the exact pagan imitation of the body and blood of Jesus Christ that are daily offered up on the altars of churches during the holy sacrifice of the mass in reparation for the sins of the world. Such a pagan Pachamama offering has no place in a Catholic church. And yet, not only was it brought into St. Peter's at the very head of the procession, but it was placed on the high altar itself." Unquote. <coughs> Incidentally, placing anything extraneous on the altar like this is forbidden by the general instruction of the Roman Missal that governs the Novus Ordo. Evidently, the successor of Peter was very intent that the soil offering be placed upon the altar above the tomb of St. Peter. All of this has nothing to do with so-called enculturation. It is syncretism, the deliberate blending of pagan and Christian worship, which has been fought against by the church and her missionaries for 20 centuries. Missionaries do not take a pagan idol and dress it up like the Blessed Virgin Mary or the Infant of Prague. 
they tend rather to burn and destroy idols, as we frequently read about in the lives of the saints, like St. Saint Boniface taking an ax to the Druid's trees. At one point, a Vatican talking head said that there was no, no idolatrous intention in the prostration before an Amazonian idol. Those are his exact words. No idolatrous intention. A key author of the Synod's working document, Father Paolo Suess, said it, said it doesn't matter if a pagan rite took place because it would still be the worship of God. I'm not sure how that quite works. There you have it, the apotheosis of the view that externals don't matter. It doesn't matter if people are, are bowing before a pagan statue as long as your intention is good and vaguely religious. A Catholic blogger, Father Angelo Sotelo, stated, there's been no comment or assertion from the Amazonians that they intended to adore an idol. Only when people state that they are intending to commit the sin of idolatry should they be accused of that in public. On this piece of impertinence, Father Brian Harrison comments, quote, is it not obvious that setting the bar that high for the sin of idolatry would define this offense out of existence? We could thus rid the world of idolaters by the stroke of a pen, just as some seek to reduce sexual abuse of minors overnight by simply lowering the legal age of consent, thereby redefining minor. What idolater has ever stated that he or she was intending to commit the sin of idolatry? Unquote. Brian McCall, editor of Catholic Family News, points out, quote, if the mere lack of idolatrous intention makes bowing before a pagan statue unobjectionable, then thousands of early Christian martyrs died in vain. All they needed to do is go through their actions of offering a pinch of incense to pagan gods or to the divinity of the emperor, but with the intent of saving their lives and not with the intent of giving false worship. Suggesting that, to, suggesting that any Christian worth his salt in the first three centuries should do that would have earned laughter, if not something more painful. This is basic moral theology. While a bad intention can make a good action morally wrong, the converse is not true. A good intention cannot transform an objectively evil action into something objectively good. This is an old modernist trick they used with dogma. As St. Pius X points out in Pascendi, when the modernists are caught saying something contrary to the faith, they reply, but I didn't mean it in that way. Unquote, that's Brian McCall. This brings me to my next point. Let us assume for the sake of argument that no idolatry actually took place at the Vatican in October. The hypothesis would not make the slightest difference in the judgment that must be passed on the events. Scripture teaches that we are to avoid not only evil actions, but also the appearance of evil. Any actions that may reasonably cause scandal to others. St. Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 that even if a certain idol is nothing, we would need to refrain from eating meat sacrificed to it if there was any danger of leading a brother astray. I recently had to complete a diocesan safe environment training course, which kept insisting on the principle that we must take into account not only what we do, but the appearance to others of what we do, the perceptions that may arise in others' minds. The slogan on the video was, intent is not relevant, impact is what matters. I mentioned this to a priest friend of mine. You know, I, I mentioned this uh, slogan, and I said, you know, uh, maybe they should have had the bishops at the synod do a safe environment training course, because they, they really needed to hear this slogan. And he replied without missing a beat. He said, maybe the cardinals should have done a background check on Bergoglio. <laughs> Obviously, we can't avoid all misinterpretation of our actions and motives. That's why I said, we shouldn't do things that would reasonably cause scandal to others. But we can avoid things that are likely to look bad to most ordinary people or that might at a given point in time be especially likely to be perceived as bad. Let me offer an example. If a married man and one of his female colleagues from work have to go on a business trip together, 
it would be sinful for them to share a hotel room or a hotel suite, even if there were separate beds or bedrooms. People who got wind of it might jump to false conclusions based on a realistic notion of fallen human nature. So too with the Pachamama affair. Carrying in procession and bowing down before the image of a naked woman with a bulging belly, prominent breasts, face paint, and a savage expression, an image that does not look in any way Christian, unquestionably gives the appearance of idolatry. And when there is a well-known pagan cult of Pachamama in parts of South America, the picture is complete. It does not matter. It does not matter whether anyone intended idolatry. It is enough that the appearance was manifestly given and the perception of it widespread. Sadly, we know that one of the favorite tactics of Protestant preachers in South America is to accuse the Catholic Church of idolatry. And the Amazon Synod has just provided them with a lifetime supply of new ammunition for their proselytizing efforts. Unlike Pope Francis, they don't have any fear of proselytizing. There are other indications we are dealing with syncretistic idolatry. On September 1st, in the Cathedral of Lima, Peru, so this is, of course, prior to the Synod, a mass was opened with the hymn, and I'm not, this is not made up. I wish it were. Mother Earth, Pachamama, we've come to sing to you. The celebrant of mass was the Pope Francis-appointed Archbishop Carlos Gustavo Castillo Matasolio. The hymn includes these words, which can be heard online in, in the video. Pachamama, good mother, destroyed without love, and your soil mistreated, and rivers muddy already, there are no more forests, there are cities with cement and solitude. Forgive me, mother, for my carelessness. Mother Earth, I must convert. Moreover, the Italian Bishops' Conference, even before the Synod, published an Incan prayer to Pachamama that reads in part, Pachamama of these places, drink and eat this offering at will, so that this land may be fruitful. Pachamama, good mother, be propitious, be propitious. We ask you, we ask you from you, give us everything. Be propitious, be propitious, unquote. Published by the Italian Bishops' Conference. Bishop Erwin Kreutler, a key figure in the Synod, stated on October 30th that the Pachamama statues were, quote, a form of expression of the indigenous people which could be integrated into our Catholic liturgy. And if it is for many a divinity, then it is an attack upon the soul of a people to throw them into the Tiber, unquote. This is an astonishing pair of statements. I, for while admitting that many still perceive and treat Pachamama as a divinity, he nonetheless advocates integrating it into the proposed Amazonian rite of mass as a valuable symbol. I don't know whether to marvel more at the blasphemy or at the sheer intellectual incoherence. Symbols matter, they mean something. Symbols are not haphazard things that can be interpreted any which way we want. Should we be surprised that all this is happening? In a way, yes, and in a way, no. We are reaping the rotten fruit of 50 years of Karl Rahner's theory of the anonymous Christian, the Nouvelle Theologie's conflation of the natural and supernatural orders, liberation theology's idea of the world as divine revelation and of secular society and human culture as equal or superior to the church, and many other popular post-conciliar errors, including what Father Serafino Lanzetta calls eco-religion. So yes, what we're seeing is horrifying, but it is the natural outcome of all of these sorts of errors. Another commentator notes, quote, the instrumentum laboris for the Amazonian Synod promoted the so-called Theologia India as a means to enrich Catholic theology, starting with the introduction of a dual notion of God, male and female at the same time, God father and God mother, where the mother would be mother nature. This dual deity is to be honored by introducing ancient Meso-American and South American rites into the liturgical rites of the Catholic Church." Unquote. This brings me to the second theme of my talk, inculturation. In recent decades, there has been great confusion about the concept of inculturation, 
We can see this confusion rising again to the surface with the notorious Instrumentum Laboris, or working document, that was released prior to the Amazon Synod and criticized by bishops and theologians across the world. Enculturation has been taken by its modern proponents to mean that the Catholic faith and its practice should be changed to conform to an indigenous culture and should assimilate that culture's own religious beliefs and practices. In other words, Catholicism is seen as raw material and the alien culture as an agent of transformation. The inst and that's the church with the Amazonian face. The Instrumentum Laboris tells us, for example, quote, in function of a healthy decentralization of the church, the Amazonian communities ask the Episcopal conferences to adapt the Eucharistic ritual to their cultures, unquote. By the way, there's no real evidence that the Amazonian communities are asking for any of this stuff, but that's another story. It's the Germans who are asking for it. And citing Francis again, quote, we must be bold enough to discover new signs and new symbols, new flesh to embody and communicate the word, doesn't say which word, and different forms of beauty which are valued in different cultural settings, unquote. The document continues with a strangely authoritarian passage culminating in Marxist utopian language. Quote, the celebration of the faith must be carried out in an enculturated way so that it may be an expression of one's own religious experience and a bond of communion in the celebrating community. So, so notice that the notion of worship there is an expression of one's own religious experience. That's, that's a very modernist position, right? It's, it's so subjective and a bond of communion with the celebrating community, so horizontal, is a purely horizontal notion of worship. Uh, it goes on, an enculturated liturgy will also be a sounding board for the struggles and aspirations of the communities and a transforming impulse towards a land without evil, unquote. How will such liturgies look? The document tells us, quote, it is suggested that the celebrations should be festive with their own music and dances, using indigenous languages and clothing in communion with nature and with the community. This sounds like a hippie fest, love fest. You know. <laughs> we are asked to overcome the rigidity of a discipline that excludes and alienates and practice a pastoral sensitivity that accompanies and integrates." Un unquote. The language of communion with nature and with the community is naturalistic and horizontal at loggerheads with the supernatural and vertical character of the revealed religion of Christ and its cultic action, the formal, objective, solemn, public worship known as the sacred liturgy. We note also a radical departure from the unanimous teaching of all the popes, including John Paul II and Benedict XVI, who underlined with Vatican II that the traditional music of the faith, Gregorian chant and polyphony, should be given the foremost place as indeed the first missionaries who planted the cross on the soil of South America themselves did, training natives to be musicians and composers of superb quality. So you can, you can buy recordings of wonderful music composed by Central American and South American uh, natives who were trained by the Europeans, and they, were, and they became excellent composers as a result. The enculturation described in the working document and reiterated in the Synod's final document is a false approach, rooted in religious indifferentism, dogmatic relativism, and liturgical experimentalism. Ironically, if acted upon, <clears throat> this approach would not inspire new currents of culture in the Amazon, but would merely colonize non-Europeans with the modern European angst of ex-Christian self-loathing a hatred directed uniquely at Europe's own past and the church's own traditions. <clears throat> the Africans who sing Gregorian chant, as Cardinal uh, Sara says, they love singing chant. They don't have this self-loathing uh, phenomenon that Europeans have. In reality, it is pagan cultures that are in need of conversion and elevation. Any elements taken from these cultures, any kind of artistic elements, for example, duly purged of sin and error, will stand as matter to the form imparted by the life-giving Catholic faith. It is the church that is the agent, form, and goal in any true enculturation, 
While the recipient culture is the matter, the material that receives the form from the agent for the sake of salvation in Christ. Many cultures benefited from the Roman Missal in its integrity and fullness. For example, the Japanese and Chinese initially welcomed the beauty and majesty of the traditional Latin liturgy as celebrated by the Jesuit missionaries, seeing in it a sublime expression of a divinely revealed religion powerfully conveyed in ceremonies and texts. The reason that Christianity ended up being persecuted in China and Japan was because of the envy of the elite at the success that the Christians were having with their tr Tridentine liturgy. Hostile cultures have been overcome by the persistent witness of a religion more definite, more coherent, and more beautiful than any of mankind's false religions. In any case, it is never necessary to seek as a goal to take elements of a heathen culture and incorporate them into the sacred culture. If there are elements worthy of elevation into the sacral domain, this will happen slowly, subtly, and with discernment. Running after these elements in a kind of desperate hunt for relevancy is doomed to failure. It is a kind of prostitution to the present age and its malevolent prince. A so-called Amazonian rite, manufactured by committee and imposed by Episcopal fiat, is contrary to the laws of organic liturgical development and the primacy of the gospel over all cultures to which it arrives. Enculturation as it has been understood and practiced by liturgical revolutionaries is one more ploy of Satan to destabilize and denature the Church of God, to water down her distinctiveness and poison and pollute her divine cultus and human culture. Things that are really good, true, and beautiful in a native people and their civilization will line up in front of the doors of the church and beg admission. They will sue for peace and beg pardon and offer themselves like lambs for the sacrifice. Then we may take them up in our arms and make of them vehicles of grace, but not in any other way. As St. Augustine says, <clears throat> he that believes not is truly demoniac, blind, and dumb. And he that has not understanding of the faith, nor confesses, nor gives praise to God, is subject to the devil. The church does not go to the blind and dumb to ask for advice on how she should worship or what she should believe. She does not go to subjects of the devil in desperate need of baptism and beg them for a seat at Belial's table. The great Jesuit, Dominican, and Franciscan missionaries brought forward the Catholic faith in all of its splendor and abiding truth, and by that light they converted nations and baptized all that was noble and good in their people. The instrumentum laboris, however, bluntly sets aside traditional views of evangelization, salvation, and sanctification. Quote, an insincere stance of openness to the other, as well as a corporatist attitude, which reserves salvation exclusively to one's own creed, is destructive of the same creed. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus explained this to the inquiring lawyer. Love lived in any religion pleases God. This is the, this is the working document. <laughs> Through an exchange of gifts, the Spirit can lead us ever more fully into truth and goodness, unquote. In this remarkable text from the working document, Christians are said to be insincere if they are not so open to the other that they will admit that their Christianity is lacking in some truth or goodness that the non-Christians can offer instead. Now, it can happen accidentally that a non-Christian would preserve some truth or some aspect of the good that Christians have forgotten, but it's already in the Christian tradition, and it's the Christian's fault for having forgotten it. It's not that Christianity lacks something that we need to get from the pagans. That's, the, that's what the working document seems to be saying. Moreover, the de fide dogma extra ecclesiam nulla salus, outside the church there is no salvation, is dismissed here as a corporatist attitude, destructive of one's own creed, in spite of the fact that no one can be saved who does not belong to the church and who does not confess, either explicitly or implicitly, that salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. The document then fatuously asserts that love lived in any religion pleases God. Although the New Testament, remember that document, makes it clear 
that only the love poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which we call charity, is the love of God that pleases him. So this, this uh, working document is truly flagrantly heretical on, on about 150 points. Perhaps the most startling error in the Instrumentum Laboris and in the Synod discussions is the idea of the world as a more complete divine revelation than that found in the Lex Orandi and Lex Credendi of Christianity. That is to say, in the creed and the worship of the faith. Quote, in the Amazon, life is inserted into, linked with, and integrated in territory. This vital and nourishing physical space provides the possibility, sustenance, and limit of life. Furthermore, we can say that the Amazon, or another indigenous or communal territory, is not only an ubi, or a where, a geographical space, but also a quid, or a what, a place of meaning for faith or the experience of God in history. Thus, territory is a theological place where faith is lived and also a particular source of God's revelation epiphanic places where the reserve of life and wisdom for the planet is manifest, a life and wisdom that speaks of God. In the Amazon, the caresses of God become manifest and become incarnate in history, unquote. It's a remarkable passage. I'm not sure what some of it means, but, but the parts that I understand are <laughs> rather disturbing. In an interview with Ross Douthat, published on November 9th, Raymond Cardinal Burke observes, quote, what was proposed in the working document is an apostasy from the Catholic faith, a denial of the unicity and universality of the redemptive incarnation of our Lord Jesus' saving work. I mean the idea that Jesus' grace is one element in the cosmos, but it's the cosmos, the world, that is the ultimate revelation. And therefore, even in going to a region like the Pan-Amazon region, you wouldn't be concerned to preach the gospel because you recognize there already the revelation of God. This is a falling away from the Christian faith, unquote. I view the synod as representing the repudiation of Pope Benedict XVI's Regensburg address. I don't know how, how many of you remember when he went over and gave this address and all the Muslims started burning effigies of the Pope and so on, in which he explained why the program of de-Hellenization is contrary to the wisdom and providence of God. The call for de-Hellenization is based on the claim that a pure original form of Christianity was compromised or even perverted by the intertwining of Greek culture and philosophical thought with the original kerygma or proclamation of the good news. So the idea behind how the, this theory is Christianity's original pure substance was mingled with Greek pagan thought, and that corrupted it. The program can be traced back to the Protestant reformers of the 16th century who argued that after the conversion of the Emperor Constantine, Christianity, which was intended, according to them, to be a domestic, familial religion of breaking bread and giving thanks for the holiness of everyday life, was distorted into an imperial, sacerdotal, hierarchical, patriarchal, dogmatic religion that eventually exalted asceticism, monasticism, and strict sexual morality. The de-Hellenizers want to remove Christianity from its Jewish, Greek, Roman, and European cultural matrix and to Africanize or Asianize or Amazonify it. They want to make it a vehicle for the divine self-expression inherent in every people and culture, which of course is not what anyone ever thought the Christian faith was or was supposed to be. Our religion comes to us from God decisively intervening in human history and giving us the message of salvation, to which every culture, like every individual, must bend the knee in a process of conversion. It is man who must submit to the truth from on high, Submit in faith, in baptism, in, in ecclesial order, in liturgy. It is not the truth that must submit to man and reflect his inner aspirations or feelings or ideas. This latter view was espoused by the modernists of the 19th and early 20th centuries and by their latter-day disciples, including Pope Francis. We should not be surprised that he has espoused so many heresies, dozens of them, for modernism itself was defined by St. Pius X as the synthesis of all heresies. 
Thus, we can see the Amazon Synod as a moment of accelerated dechristianization, an inversion and perversion of the Catholic religion. So my third topic, clerical celibacy. Also much in the news for many months has been the subtle attack of the modernists against the ancient discipline of clerical celibacy. It is important to understand that this attack has nothing to do with a shortage of clergy. There has always been a shortage of clergy in missionary territories, but no one prior to our decadent age has ever thought that abolishing celibacy was the right solution. Rather, the church has always obeyed Christ by redoubling her prayers to the Lord of the harvest, asking him to send more workers into the vineyard, and by purifying herself of corruption so that she may be found worthy of having her prayers answered. We also know, as Bishop Athanasius Schneider says in his outstanding book, Christus Vincit, which if you don't have it, you should definitely get hold of that and read it. You, you won't want to put it down. There have been heroic Christians in all ages who have persevered in spite of sacramental deprivation because they had been taught the faith and they remained true to it. He cites especially the example of Japanese Catholics who held on to the Orthodox faith for more than 200 years without clergy or recourse to any sacraments besides baptism. When French missionaries reestablished contact with these Christians, they were amazed to find that they knew the Apostles' Creed and many prayers, including the Our Father, the Hail Mary, and the other prayers of the Rosary in both Japanese and Latin. Frankly, this is a better track record than the local churches in almost any country after the Second Vatican Council, <laughs> in spite of a comparative abundance of bishops and priests. So in order to understand the attack against mandatory celibacy, we must look deeper than the excuses of its proponents. The devil hates priestly celibacy because like consecrated virginity, it is a charism and way of life most intrinsically opposed to the pride that brought about Lucifer's fall. Let me explain why I make this claim. The devil desired to receive beatitude as a reward for his own natural greatness, not as a pure gift of grace undeserved by any creature. He desired to be the firstborn son who received the homage of inferior creation, perhaps even to be a mediator between the human race and its creator. When God revealed that he would enter into friendship with rational animals, so vastly inferior to the angels, and grant them beatitude, that his own word would become flesh, that this word made flesh would raise up the human race by suffering and dying for it, Lucifer would have none of it. His love of self turned inward. In his pride, he said, non serviam, I will not serve God. I will not serve such a God. I will not serve such a plan. Lucifer rejected the supernatural in favor of the natural. The man or woman who chooses virginity or celibacy for the kingdom of God is doing the opposite, setting aside the natural in favor of the supernatural. The virgin or celibate is relinquishing that which is most natural to the human being, to live in partnership with another of the opposite sex, finding in this community a friendship and fruitfulness intended for man from the beginning, written into his very bodily nature. Just as nothing is more natural to man than marriage, Nothing is more suitable to expressing the primacy of God over creation than relinquishing it for his sake. In a supreme testimony to the sufficiency of his love, an offering of one's entire self to him in love. The life of a celibate is a holocaust in imitation of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who gave all of himself to his bride, the church. As the word became flesh for our sakes, the consecrated soul makes of his or her own flesh a living word of total consent and surrender to God. The celibate is therefore the supreme human sign of God's radically self-emptying redemptive love, and thus the complete antithesis of Lucifer's self-absorption. Now, as the saints pray without ceasing and generate prayer in others, so the devil, who is a liar and the father of lies, lies without ceasing, and fathers ever more lies in his victims. He persuades people to think that celibacy or virginity is a denigration of marriage, 
that those who promote this higher state and calling are casting aspersions on the order of creation, the goodness of nature, the beauty of married love. He presents himself at times as a defender of these things, but only in a distorted way, as Martin Luther was. The devil wants the exclusive commitment of priests and religious to the Lord and his people to be diluted or abandoned, so that stripped of the clothing of grace, they can follow him to the emptiness and frustration of eternally denuded nature. Most of all, he sows the lie that man cannot be fulfilled apart from sexual experience and expression, that humans are maimed and impoverished if they do not enjoy intimate conjunction with another. How subtle the strategy of Satan is. The ultimate poverty for man is, in reality, to live without God, to live without knowledge of or desire for eternal communion with him in heaven. Since the priesthood and the religious life are both directly ordered to living out and proclaiming the reality and primacy of the kingdom of heaven, it is crucial for the well-being of mankind that priests and religious be clear signs of our ultimate destiny. For in heaven, as our Lord teaches, there is neither marrying nor giving in marriage. The one all-sufficient marriage in heaven is the perfect union of Christ and his church. That's why there's no marrying or giving in marriage in heaven. The devil's strategy is multifaceted. He works to undermine the covenant of marriage, which is the sacramental sign of the indissoluble fruitful union of Christ and his church. The contemporary war against marriage is also, indeed more deeply, a war against the nuptial union of Christ and his church, a vain but frenzied effort to erase from the minds of men any memory of this glorious union consummated on the cross. Satan works to undermine the most holy Eucharist, which is the sign and cause of our communion with Christ, our highest sharing in his self-oblation on the cross. He works to undermine the priesthood and religious life, which exemplify and bring about in this world the ordering of all creation through Christ to the Father, who is the beginning and end of all things. The common element in all of these attacks, the attack on marriage, the attack on the Eucharist, the attack on celibacy, virginity, is the devil's fury that anyone or anything natural should ever be subordinated to that which is supernatural that a faithful, radical self-sacrifice should be the path of salvation and blessedness. False teachings on marriage and the relaxation of the required discipline of clerical celibacy are two flanks of a single army laying siege to the city of God on earth. Any word, any action against the sanctity of marriage, the good of the family, or the exalted vocation of clerical and religious life finds its origin in the general of this army, whom St. Ignatius of Loyola called the enemy of mankind. I wish now to confront head-on the claim that both modernists and Eastern Christians will often make, although for quite different reasons, let me underline that. Namely, that clerical celibacy is just a disciplinary matter, something that depends only on church authority and could be easily changed. This is not true. Celibacy is one of the crown jewels of Latin Christianity. The roots of it are found in many passages of the New Testament and confirmed by abundant testimonies from the church fathers. Marriage is not absolutely incompatible with holy orders, since the power of order is a supernatural gift that may be conferred on any apt man by the laying on of hands. So you can have married clergy. However, marriage is relatively incompatible with holy orders which explains why from apostolic times on, there is a steady effort to enforce perpetual continence among the clergy. The Christian East still bears witness to this connection in three ways. First, they hold monastic or consecrated life as the highest, vo highest vocation. Second, bishops may be chosen only from celibates. And third, even married clergy must abstain from marital relations the day before the offering of the divine liturgy which is one of the reasons why a daily Eucharistic liturgy is rare in the East outside of monasteries and cathedrals. In truth, celibacy is profoundly fitting to the clerical state, and fittingness in the Catholic tradition is often the highest and strongest argument for what we believe and what we do. We need to think about this, right? To say something is fitting is potent. For example, we say that it was fitting that the Son of God empty himself of the radiance of glory and become a lowly man in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
We say that it was fitting that he should die upon the cross in atonement for our sins. We say that it was fitting for Christ to found a visible church with visible and efficacious signs of grace. For these sublime truths, which are at the very heart of our faith, there are no strictly necessary arguments. There are only arguments from how beautiful it is that God should be this way or act this way. In short, the greatest mysteries of our faith are said to be true because we can see that they harmonize with who God is and how he works. It is no different with celibacy. It is fitting that the one who follows the virginal Christ, who gave his entire life as a pleasing offering to God, should imitate him in exactly this way. The Amazon Synod's recommendation, therefore, strikes at the Catholic Church's imitatio Christi, her adherence to biblical teaching and patristic wisdom at witness, and her fidelity to a consistent magisterium from the earliest times until now. This novelty of the synod must be rejected without qualification. Then my, my final topic is ministries for women. On this final topic, I will have relatively little to say, both because this lecture is already lengthy and because there is nothing difficult about this matter. All traditional Eucharistic liturgies, whether of the Christian East or of the Christian West, are hierarchically structured. The roles of bishop, priest, deacon, subdeacon, lector, acolyte, and so forth are clearly delineated. Only men serve in these roles since they are all modes of exercising Christ's royal priesthood in the flesh. This is very important. Christ is a priest according to his human nature, his body. He's not a priest in his eternal divine spiritual nature as son. Right? Now, now, of course, after the incarnation, you can say the son of God is a priest, but he becomes a priest according to his flesh. Right? That's very, very important. The so whoever exercises a priestly or or, or or quasi-priestly ministry should be conformed to him in precisely that way. The faithful in attendance also have their role at the, in the liturgy, which is not to be confused with the roles of any of the ministers. Moreover, all traditional liturgies are designed for and make expressive use of buildings in which the sanctuary, representing the Holy of Holies and the Church Triumphant, is clearly separated from the nave, representing this world and the Church Militant. Only certain individuals properly vested may enter into the sanctuary during the liturgy. The reason they can do that is because they're acting to a certain extent in persona Christi, in the person of the one who has passed through the veil, as the letter to the Hebrews says. Christian theology is thus articulated in the hierarchical nature of the liturgy and in the architecture itself, especially through the use of barriers, doors, and images of saints. This is, that's just by way of, of laying the groundwork. There's obviously much more that, that, that could be said about that topic, but what I'm trying to convey is any traditional Christian liturgy is, is they're unanimous about these matters, the architecture and the structuring of the liturgy. Um, they're all reflections of the priesthood of Christ. There are, there are scattered indications throughout church history of an office that was known as deaconess. Sometimes this term meant a deacon's wife. At other times, it means widows who received a special blessing for their pastoral work. They are mentioned in Origen, Clement of Alexandria, and John Chrysostom, among others. Their purpose was to assist with the pastoral care of women, women being baptized by full immersion, uncatechized women needing instruction, or sick women needing visitation. They apparently served also at times as ushers. In the Western church, however, they became less and less needed as baptism moved away from full immersion to sprinkling and society became more generally Christian. So less catech catechizing was taking place. They appear less and less in historical records until they vanish from sight around the start of the second millennium. What is clear from the historical record is that deaconesses never exercised a properly liturgical ministry, one involved with the administration of the sacraments, especially the offering of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Thus, to talk today of deacons and deaconesses in the same breath is simply to equivocate, like speaking of the canons of a cathedral and the Roman canon. The word in Greek simply means servant. And surely both men and women were serving in various capacities. But just as the practice of giving communion in the hand 
died out over a thousand years ago, and besides, it didn't look like the way it does now, so did the practice of employing deaconesses. And it is one more example of false antiquarianism to try to bring them back in a totally different context. It is unquestionably the introduction of the Novus Ordo, which was itself a product of false antiquarianism, that has created the current push for women's liturgical ministries. The new rite of mass is horizontal and democratic in its manner of practice. The hierarchical offices are either canceled out or confused. The distinction between clergy and laity is blurred. The roles of men and women are mingled in a way only imaginable after the sexual revolution. And instead of the verticality of simultaneous action directed to God, there is linear, modular, sequential liturgy in service of audience-oriented rationalism. The symbolism of separation and articulation inside the church building is not respected by the rite or its rubrics. In such an environment, there is no convincing reason to exclude women from ministries because the entire concept of liturgy has been disconnected from tradition, homogenized and harnessed to utilitarian and social functions, not symbolic and theological ones. So basically, if you have a politicized view of the liturgy and of the church, then women's ministries are going to be on the top of your list. If you think about the liturgy theologically, then that's not on, that's not on the agenda. There are some functions for which any Catholic can substitute in a pinch, such as making responses from the pews at mass if a proper acolyte or a vested male altar server is not present. This happened in the old days at girls' schools that sometimes the priest would come out and the girls would make the responses from back in the nave of the church. But we can say with historical and theological certainty that there are certain offices that can be conferred upon and exercised by men alone. The diaconate that is part of holy orders is one such office, as the magisterium has always held. A teaching supported by a mountain of scholarship and, incidentally, two independent Vatican studies. It is surely not unreasonable to think that the demons tacitly invoked throughout the synod, before it and after it, were assiduously at work to push forward the ecclesiastical sexual revolution consisting in the ever greater confusion or denial of the male and female sexes and the denigration of the gift of perpetual continence. In this way, the Vatican regime sets itself against both creation at the beginning, represented by the procreative duality of sexes, and against recreation in Christ, represented by the virginal birth and the virginal high priest. So I come to my conclusion. Looking back over this disastrous Amazon Synod, from which we will be suffering radioactive fallout for many years, the question arises, what can we do in these circumstances? What are we supposed to do? The answer is simply this. We must counteract the apostasy in the church by adoring the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, as devoutly and fervently as we can. We must hold fast to the one and only Catholic faith received from tradition and never abandon it under any pressures or threats whatsoever. We should increase our mass attendance and rosaries, renew our consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary, do penance and make reparation, especially by fasting and going to Eucharistic adoration. When the apostles could not cast out a certain demon, the Lord said to them, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. Are we not confronting today the work of demons, no longer acting in secret, but openly? We have to approach the state of the church today with Christian realism. This is a realism that recognizes the way things really are, judging from obvious signs of the times. The Gospel of John says of Judas, he, therefore, having received the morsel, went out immediately, and it was night. Not long after, our Lord said to his enemies in the Garden of Gethsemane, But this is your hour and the power of darkness. For us, it is night. It is the hour of the Judases, the high priests, scribes, and soldiers of the temple. The power of darkness reigns. But Christian realism is also supernatural realism one that is shot through with hope and confidence. We recognize that God himself, omnipotent, omniscient, 
has permitted this darkness since nothing escapes his will and that he is and always will be in charge as Christ, while sleeping in the boat, remained in charge of the storm. When God permits evil, he does so in order to raise up saints and to expose the works of darkness for their ugliness. As long as any convenient compromise between the church and the world remains hidden, it endures. But when the ugliness of this compromise becomes visible, then its doom is upon it. Every period of crisis in the history of the church has yielded to a subsequent period of peace and light, thanks to the trustful prayers and strenuous efforts of the saints. Such periods of peace and light are and will always be relative and temporary in this veil of tears. We have here no abiding city, but we seek one that is to come. Hebrews 13, 14. Father Zulsdorf issued this rousing call to arms, which I want to share with you. Quote, we are in the fight of our lives. Battle isn't pretty. Just as a soldier in the state of grace who, knows, who does his duty knows that even in battle he is in the safest place he can be, so too we know that we members of the church in the state of grace are in the safest place we could be, even though corruption and infidelity and disgusting things are going on at every level. Since the church is of divine origin, there is no place else we should ever want to be. We can be sad sometimes at the results of the battle, we can be afraid sometimes in the midst of the battle, but let us not waver in our trust in Christ's promises. Heaven is our reward, not worldly security, even in the church. The Lord is my strength and shield, and my trusting heart exults in him, and with song I will give him thanks, even for the terrible battle it falls to me to fight. Moreover, this is still Father Z, Rome is only Rome. The Vatican is only the Vatican. Curial structures are not of divine origin. Christ promised nothing to the Roman Curia. He made no guarantees that the faith would be preserved in the Curia. Put not your trust in princes, in the children of men in whom there is no salvation. Stick to the true and the proven. Stick to traditional sources for the review of the content of your Catholic faith. Remember, too, that the content of your faith is not just stuff to be read and memorized, but is also a person with whom you have a relationship. Stick to Christ. Use the sacraments well. Review your own state in life, and having determined your duties and obligations, carry them out faithfully and with singularity of purpose. Unquote. Supernatural realism also recognizes that the church on earth is only the outer shell, so to speak, of the mystical body of Christ. Understandably, we are caught up in what is happening around us on earth, but we must never forget that the church triumphant in heaven is far greater than the church militant on earth. It is populated with countless angels and saints, all of whom have passed beyond the trials of this world to an eternal blessedness that can never be lost. The heavenly liturgy is indescribably glorious and beautiful, the friendships of the saints overflowing with joy. Nothing and no one can touch this kingdom of God, this kingdom of unending peace and never darkening light where Christ the King reigns as absolute monarch over perfectly free and willing subjects. This is the Catholic Church first and foremost. We on earth are united to it by our baptism, and if we remain faithful, we will find ourselves there after death, no matter what happens in this messy world. To me, this is a great consolation, because it helps me to think twice before I say something like, the church is crumbling before our eyes, or the church is being destroyed. No. Parts of the church on earth are apostatizing because those who still live in this mortal life can change for the worse. But the church of Christ in its now existing perfection is immortal, spotless, beyond the reach of sin or the devil. And we are members of that same church, sustained by its prayers, enveloped in its grace, drawn onward by its glory. The gates of hell cannot prevail. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
<clears throat> well, um, I suppose that my my list is going to is going to overlap with yours to some extent. Um, I, I definitely uh, revere Bishop Schneider a great deal. He's a, he's a he's a friend of mine, not a close friend, but I do know him personally. We've worked together, and um, you know, having gotten to know him a little bit, he is um, he is very saintly. He's a very saintly man. Um, it's not a show at all. It's the opposite. I mean, he, he, he experienced Soviet persecution, and his whole family did, and he has martyrs in his family, and he's not, gonna, he's not going to back down for anything or anyone. Um, you know, I think I, I, I have always loved Cardinal Burke. I still do, um, and I know how many difficulties he's been through. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize how difficult the situations are for people like that right now. Um, I have met in my travels, I've met so many good bishops, bishops who really believe. Um, they don't always speak out very clearly, but um, I think when push comes to shove, they'll come down on the right side. Uh, priests to lay faithful mothers, fathers of big families. I mean, it's, there, is, there is actually, there is what I like to call the cellular regeneration of tradition against modernist cancer. Um, there, that's happening right now. Uh, it's happening all over the place in the world, practically everywhere. Um, I've seen it, you know, firsthand. I'm, I'm in touch with, and I think, I think what that shows is that, as I said in my talk, that the the worse the situation gets, um, the more you know the man of the hour is is raised up, and the woman of the hour is raised up for that situation. So I really do believe that, and I've seen it too. It's not just blind faith. Yeah, so I think one of the one of the very great challenges of our situation, and it's certainly not something that any of us was bargaining for, that we expected to see this. Um, obviously, God knew from all eternity it was coming. But um, Pope Francis has resurrected long forgotten theological disputes about what happens when you have a heretic pope or what happens you know, when, when a pope goes off the deep end, basically. Because this was all discussed. I mean, the scholastics were extremely thorough. John of St. Thomas, Cajetan, Melchior Cano, uh, Robert Bellarmine, all these people discussed at great length the hypothesis of a heretical pope. And they, and they had to deal with it partly because they wanted to be comprehensive, but partly because there were certainly instances in church history where you had popes who were, let's just say, however you interpret the situation, they were on the wrong side and they should have known better. Um, and so they had to deal with this, this question, but it's, it's now so flagrant that people are kind of floundering and flailing. And that's, I mean, part of what's happened too is that we've had several centuries of actually very good popes. I mean, comparatively speaking, right? If you look at church history, 265 popes, there's been, you know, there's been the heights of sanctity and the depths of depravity in that 2000 year history. Church history is very important to study. Yeah, well, so I, I do, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to um, cause a panic, you know, <laughs> suddenly an er eruption of panic here. But I, I, I do tend to think in somewhat apocalyptic terms. Maybe it's because I've read too much Robert Hugh Benson or Soloviov or something like that. But um, I, 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 I could very, I could definitely envision a kind of mass apostasy happening in the Catholic Church. Um, for example, it wouldn't surprise me if in the next few decades the church in Germany just simply ceases to be part of the Catholic Church. That seems almost a no-brainer to me. I mean, unless there's some divine intervention that prevents that from happening, like Pope Leo the Fourteenth or Pope Benedict the Seventeenth or whoever um, we're all praying for. But um, but I, I also think that you know we could see situations of you know underground masses. I mean, you know, all the stuff that Bishop Schneider talks about in in, in the Soviet Union 
we have to take that very seriously, not because there's a Soviet Union anymore, but because Marxism and liberation theology and so on, it's all still there. All the, in fact, Schneider says in, in Christus Vinci, something that was really eye-opening for me. He says that we shouldn't too quickly say, you know, Soviet communism slash Marxism fell in 1989. What he says was its errors were broadcast over the whole earth. That is, it was like it was like some kind of plant that when it when it dies, then its seed pod opens and and all the seeds go all over the place. Um, and I think he's right because the gender, all of the gender, the weird gender stuff that's going on right now, is a kind of radical application of Marxist Hegelian dialectical theory. I mean, it seems to me that. Um, a lot of the errors of the German philosophers are are kind of sprouting up all over the place, and what that could mean is that, you know, there could be um, dioceses where you have s ultra modernist bishops who just simply try to stomp out the Latin Mass, for instance, just to take something that's that we all love dearly, um, and in in places like that, you know, the, the priests and the faith are going to have to go underground if that happens. Um, so we really have to, I think we need to be mentally prepared for the worst. It's like they always say for first aid and things like that, be prepared for the worst so that if it doesn't, if it happens, you can deal with it. And if it doesn't happen, you can breathe a sigh of relief. So it's better to think, not necessarily um, in a pessimistic or cynical way, but just to think about what could really happen because things that bad have happened earlier in church history. So it, when, when Christ says the gates of hell will not prevail, he, he wasn't saying you're going to have an easy life. He didn't, he didn't make that promise. Um, and of course, whatever we suffer, St. Paul says, is nothing compared to the glory that God has promised to us. <clears throat> well, I mean, the, the reason I brought up the Japanese, the, the sort of lost Christians of Japan, is that, uh, you know, they actually managed to hold on to the faith with only baptism um, because they didn't have any clergy. And I, you know, certainly I hope that that wouldn't be the case. But it's, again, our fundamental obligation is to actually to hold the faith, to believe. Um, and so uh, Schneider, I know I keep bringing him up, but I, Christus Vinci is very much on my mind. Um, <clears throat> he talks about how in his village, the priest came once a year to hear confessions. So it was a traveling priest who traveled incognito, just like in Elizabethan England, you know. And the priest would come into the village looking like, you know, a coal miner or whatever. And, uh, and they would go into a house and somebody would keep watch and everybody would go to confession and take hours and hours, you know, for the whole, all the Catholics in the village to, to get to confession. And, uh, um, it's amazing that more of these people weren't caught, but actually some of them when the priests he talked about were caught and put into the gulag. Um, and you know, they would then celebrate mass in secret and then everybody received communion. So communion and confession once a year is what they were trying to do in the Soviet union. Um, so, you know, you could see something like that happening. Or in Elizabethan England, it was the same thing. You know, Edmund Campion and the Jesuits, they came to wherever, whatever house they could get to, they would go to. Um, but, you know, we're not there yet. So, so, And actually, as I was saying before, and I really mean this, this is not false optimism on my part, um, there are actually quite a few bishops in the church who, even if they're not going to be fighters on the front line, like Bishop Schneider, <clears throat> they actually look at something like a fraternity of St. Peter Parish, and they say, that's what renewal looks like, and I want that for my diocese. Um, <clears throat> I think a great example of that would be Archbishop Chaput, who really wasn't tradition-friendly, particularly, but before he had to submit his resignation, he made sure that he got the fraternity to come into his diocese, and that parish now is booming. Um, so I think that's an example of somebody who was kind of persuaded just by facts and evidence and maybe by the grave situation we're in that, oh, well, actually, tradition is a solution. Maybe he wouldn't say it's the solution, but um, someone like that can see that it's part of the solution. Um, so I, I, I actually, you know, right now, things are actually building in a, in a kind of growth phase. Um, so we'll, we'll worry about... Um, 
priest hiding holes when we need to, you know? <laughs> we'll worry about that later. Uh, I, I had a boss once who said um, that his policy was never to think about never to think about a practical decision or to make it until it was absolutely necessary. I don't know if that's good business sense, but um, but it, it uh, basically works. So. Yeah. No, it's 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 difficult to talk about lines in the sand because uh, I, I feel like in our situation there's the um, there's kind of the uh, the the spoil sport who's gone and just messed with all of our lines already, so there aren't any lines anymore. They've all been trespassed. Um, so I, I I don't know. I don't really know what 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 more we're looking for. That that is say what we need to do is hold fast to the traditional Catholic faith, whatever that takes, and in a way. Um, it seems to me that, you know, th there's a pope could try to do like if if well this is getting I think that if a pope tried to suppress the traditional Latin mass, I, I think a lot of people would ignore that because they understand now from Pope Benedict the Sixteenth that the Church doesn't have the authority to abrogate her own tradition. That's not that's not something that the pope can do. Um, you know, he can try, and people who are craven will go along with that. But if you understand. You know what was sacred and great remains sacred and great, cannot be harmful, cannot be forbidden. This is what Benedict says, right? And he says it many times, uh, in a way that makes it clear that it's not his opinion, but it's just a statement of the way things are in the nature of things, right? Um, at that point, then you just you would just have to say, well, okay, we have a crazy pope. We're not going to listen to that. Um, and that that's that would clearly have to be the case because you know if the pope told us to to do something which was against natural or divine law. We would have to also not go along with that, right? Obedience is always obedience to what to to a commandment that is either good or indifferent, right? Saint Thomas is very clear about this. Um, if your superior tells you to do something evil, you have to say no, right? So.